Hi, I'm Dalom. I'm in the car wash today and um, today we're going to be talking about the copyright system that Nissan put into the Leaf to try and prevent batteries from being swapped from vehicle to vehicle and how they ultimately fail. Turns out the car wash isn't such a good place to record audio, so let's continue this from home instead. Before we get into the technical details, we need some history. Back in 2010, when the Leaf launched, all batteries were fresh and nobody even knew about this battery ID protection system. After a few years, especially in hot desert areas, the Leaf batteries started to degrade rapidly. Luckily, the Leaf came with a 5 year 60k mile battery warranty, and most owners in these hot areas got a warranty replacement battery if it degraded past 70% within this time. But some owners exceeded the boundaries of the warranty and weren't able to get a free warranty replacement. Fast forward even a few more years and people were starting to experiment with putting fresher batteries into these older degraded vehicles. This is where people first encountered the invalid battery ID diagnostic trouble code. You see, if you just swap in another battery, the car will go into turtle mode with reduced power output. The car will be drivable, albeit at a dangerous slow speed, and not suitable for traffic. It's not something you can live with. On the dashboard, you will have a permanent yellow light along with the turtle icon. By searching on the My Nissan Leaf forum, we can find a few threads from 2014 that document this. It is mentioned there that only Nissan can perform battery swaps with official tools to program the vehicle control module, or VCM for short, to accept the new battery. This official setup consists of a special laptop running the Console 3 Plus tool, along with a special plug-in card called the Battery Registration Card. This crushed most people's dreams of an easy do-it-yourself battery swap. So, the battery is coded to the car. To get around this issue back in the early days, daring people tried to swap over the old lithium battery controller, or LBC for short, into the new battery. This requires great caution, since you have to open up the high voltage battery to get to the LBC. But this was one way to get around the issue. One major drawback of this is that it will take time for the LBC to relearn the new battery capacity, and the capacity bars on the dash will never return. To further complicate this for the do-it-yourselfers, Nissan did a minor redesign of the mechanical shape of the battery back in 2014, but this will be covered in a separate video. For now we will focus on the battery ID. Fast forward to 2018. A company called EVs Enhanced releases a product called the HV Battery Pairing Tool. It does exactly what it sounds like. It allows for re-pairing of batteries without the extremely expensive official Consult 3 Plus solution. Now all the do-it-yourselfers got a way to do safe and fully functioning battery swaps. The following year, another company called Muxan emerged and started to offer battery solutions. Moxan currently offers swaps, upgrades, extender batteries and other solutions slash upgrades for the Leaf. The interesting thing is that they do not use any pairing tools to achieve the battery swaps. So how do they do it? Let's take a look. To understand more about how the battery ID works, we need to look at the CAN data that travels on the EV CAN bus. We are interested in this bus since it's the one that connects the LBC inside the battery to the VCM inside the car. Let's start by looking at the CAN database file that I compiled. This is available on my GitHub, links in the description. The information in this database is stuff that the community figured out over the years, but also some of my own findings. I'm using the Quasa database editor to open this file to make it easier to visualize what's happening. If I quickly sort here, I can see which ones are being sent by the lithium battery controller. The message that we are interested in today is the one with the message hex ID 1DC. This message contains a few power limiters, but more interestingly, it contains the codes for the LBC. First, we have the lithium battery code condition, then we have code number one and code number two. 
If we look here on the right, we can see how they are positioned in the frame. First here we have the code condition, code 1 and code 2. Uh, the first code condition is a value that goes between 0 and 3. The rest ones is the actual data that is like rolling. Uh, as you can see also they are a bit awkwardly positioned between frame 4, 5 and 6. This is due to space limitations. But um, it doesn't matter much since we have this pre-compiled DBC file that will do all the magic. So it will be easier for us to simply pop this into another program and have it to do all the heavy lifting. So now when we know where to look, we can use this file and apply it to some raw CAN data. Okay, let's take a look at some real CAN data. Here I have a log file from my own car that I've taken with the program CAN runner. So let's open that up and uh, let's create a virtual CAN channel. Uh, this is, by the way, an excellent freeware tool. I've been using this a lot for this. So now when we have created the virtual CAN channel, we can go to the traffic generator section and we can replay a log. I'm just going to select that log file that I have. And now I can just select if I want to just push individual frames, play the file once or loop the file. So if I just start playing this file, press play, you can see all the messages that are traveling on the AV CAN bus. OK, now that we have a way to generate traffic, I can switch to another program, which is called XTM. This is a demo version of XTM, which allows you to visualize traffic on virtual CAN channels. So I've already set up this uh, desktop here. Let me just quickly stop this. I have a scope running, which displays the LB code 2, LB code 1, and the code condition. The same stuff is also being displayed on a panel here. So if I play the file and I start XTM, you can see that it springs into life. If I zoom out a bit on this scope, you can see that we get a lot of data incoming here. And it's uh, going quite fast. This uh, panel doesn't have enough update rate to keep up with this. It's um, simply skipping. So to try and make sense of this, we can instead in CAN runner push individual frames instead. So if I just step through, if I just click this next frame button, we can instead visualize this a bit better. So if I just step it like this, you can see that the code condition goes from 0, 1, 2, 3, and then it goes back to 0. And the two sections with code, code 1 and code 2, are rolling along with it. The code 1 and code 2 generate a total of 8 bytes of data that the VCM expects from the LBC. If you swap in another battery, the code 1 and 2 will contain something different, and the VCM will detect this and set the invalid battery diagnostic trouble code. Now that you know how the ID works, it's quite easy to come up with ways to defeat this. You could try and brute force attack it, but I wouldn't recommend it. Since you know your old ID, you can simply replace the new ID with the old one on the CAN bus using a man-in-the-middle attack. Now you might be wondering, how do I tell what battery ID I have? The easiest way that doesn't involve patching into the EV CAN bus manually is to use the latest beta version of LeafSpy Pro. This version can read the battery ID and output it into the ECU version service screen. In this screenshot on the right, you can see the battery ID reported by LeafSpy circled in red. You might have noticed that LeafSpy outputs the data as an 8 character ASCII string. I've created this spreadsheet to be able to quickly convert it to decimal or hex data to use for actual battery swaps and upgrades that I do. I think this is enough for one video. If you made it this far, you're now an expert on how the battery ID works on the Nissan Leaf. I've put links to all the softwares and tools used in the description of this video. In a future video, we can take a look at how the pairing is done using official tools. Huge thanks to all Patreon supporters for making this video possible.